It might not have been much fun for Ireland fans, but lodged in the middle of a very different feeling tournament, boasting endless new ideas, four new fresh-faced middle-aged coaches, of France being good again, of Italy being inventive, of Scotland without tries, of Wales without Gatland, it was refreshing to see something so familiar. The Sunday match between England and Ireland was a bit like a Wes Anderson film, a different setting, a few changes in the cast perhaps, but ultimately, for better or worse, it all feels like something you've seen before. And like so much of Wes's work, this was was all about daddy issues as England captain Owen got back at his father, Ireland coach Andy, for the time he flushes Beanie Baby down the toilet at last. This marked the first time England have beaten Ireland back to back in the championship since 2014 and the first time a Farrell had struck a second blow in a row since Owen cried over that Beanie Baby and had to learn not to be so bloody damn soft. However, whilst that might have only been three weeks ago, a lot has changed with both these teams since. This game reframed the championship for both sides with England now recovered from from their French dispatching and back in the hunt for the title and Ireland now out of Grand Slam proceedings. So how did England open up Ireland and make the Faz family Sunday dinner even more awkward than ever? When I say there's something nicely nostalgic about this game, I don't just mean the sight of seeing Johnny May run pointlessly sideways again, because England's tactics were unprecedentedly identical to last year. Ireland may have evolved a fair bit under Andy Farrell, but the one thing that hasn't really changed is how his team defends. He was the defence coach last year, after all. The idea is still a 30-man line with one fullback stood around the 50 meter line to sweep across and a wing on the opposite dropped slightly behind. This, however, was where Rob Carney came in. Carney sat amongst Ben Smith and Lee Halfpenny as one of the top players in the world at and anticipating kicks. He might have finished his career with roughly the top speed of a push chair, but he was so good at covering the ground and knowing where the ball would be before it got there that it didn't matter. Last year, Ireland experimented by playing Robbie Hendra at fullback, and it, safe to say, didn't work. And whilst bottle rocket Jordan Lama would call himself a specialist fullback, that anticipation has long since been probably the biggest weakness in his game, because England once again found plenty of space. And in terms of how they found it, well, much like a Wes Anderson film once again, everything was about the centre of the frame. Andy Farrell's defence has two carefully considered blind spots. In order to play such an aggressive main line, you're going to need to make sacrifices, and both of Farrell's are calculated risks. The first was something England exploited in literally the first minute of the game. Whereas most teams use their scrum after sweep in behind the line, Ireland like to keep Murray in the main line most of the time. This gives us the first blind spot, this kind of space right here. Normally, the only kicks you see into the space are little chips, and it becomes up to the centres and Jolly Log Sex Paper to work hard to cover them with the luxury of a bounce to accommodate this. England, however, instead just hung a huge bomb into the space, once again targeting Henshaw. It's b b before anyone could call it bullying, Elliot Daly got under and claimed the ball. Nobody hangs a bomb this narrow ever, thought Farrell. Eddie Jones and George Ford made him think again. Likewise, nobody kicks just straight down the middle of the pitch, just between the posts, because it gives you no real tactical advantage, and so Ireland's backfield has a second blind spot pretty much straight between the posts, this kind of space here. Just look at this little stab through by Baby Farrell. Murray is expecting it to take a standard trajectory towards the touchline, but it heads in field and puts him in his side under so much pressure. In some ways, it's counterintuitive, but if you can make the ball bounce in international rugby, you can cause no end of chaos, and we saw that in England's first two tries. The first is a classic case of ball bounce syndrome. George Ford hangs a kick off first phase, wide with no real chase. This is just essentially to put it in Ireland's mind that nowhere on the pitch is safe, and Lama kind of makes a tash of catching it, and then for some godforsaken reason decides not to call the mark and take on the entire English team alone. He doesn't succeed in this, and eventually Ireland clear for a pretty fantastic actually kick by Conor Murray. He just places it just, just in field, meaning Stockdale should smash the cover into touch and win Ireland the line out. Except this kind of doesn't happen, and Johnny May does brilliantly well to spin in field. From there, some other stuff happens. There's loads of this. Let's skip right to uh, here. As they're inside the 22, both Irish wingers are up flat, and Lama is off to the side. Exactly the backfield cover I just described. Ben Youngs, who fair play to him, actually had a good game, which his centers haven't said since about 2009, stabs the kick right into the blind spot. Juniper Sex Christmas is ready, however, and darts back to cover with a slight head start on his opposite number four. However, whilst Jaw Drop Sex Tango gets there first, Sex Quack has so much ground to cover to get there that a classic case of ball bounce becomes a classic case of eye off the ball and a classic case of jumbo pad sex wedge it, fumbling it right into the path of the motoring forward. Daly's try was pretty similar to his 
score last year, with England exploiting the exact same space they did for Ford's score, but Jacob Stockdale just figures the situation is safe, especially with penalty advantage on the way, and he lets it bounce. This can be said a million times, and it probably has two Stockdale since, but letting the ball bounce at international level is asking for trouble, and Elliot Daly soon enough stops it bouncing by grounding it and taking England to a 14-0 lead after 24 minutes. This all ate into Ireland. For all his merits, if Jamboree Sexlip loses his cool, Ireland will lose 9 times out of 10. And this first half was a proper vintage, full-on, shouty-mouth, purple-faced, dagger-eyes, empty rage, sex trout meltdown. Their attack began to falter. Even plays like this, where they run a move that would normally get them outside England's diagonal blitz defence, is just too slow. The players aren't committed. They're half a second off everywhere. They're just going through the motions. It's as though Andy Farrell brought up the anecdote in an analysis session on England, and now everyone, as they're catching the ball, is just wondering how powerful a flush's toilet must have to get rid of a full beanie baby. And opportunities to open them up were rare because England's defence mixed aggression and timing into a very smart package. The popular thing to talk about has been how aggressive the line speed was. And Eddie Jones being so completely shameless in nicking Razia Rasmus and South Africa's bomb squad idea allowed this. The front five have replacements on the bench, meaning they can absolutely knack themselves out over the first 50 or so minutes and then be hauled off for fresh legs who can kind of do exactly that for the last half hour. However, whilst it felt more prominent, they didn't rush more more than usual. It's the flying up that catches the eye, but what's important was how, when and where they did it. Ireland, under both Schmidt and Farrell, have been well known for tricky set plays and intricate moves using numerous runners. And so, if England got an inkling that this was what was coming, they just stepped back, stood off, didn't charge. Look at this move in particular. Ireland do a bunch of flashy passes and get it to Dewey's hat sex pong, but they drew and fixed nobody. The move was comp completely pointless and Sex Yam is forced to take it in behind the game line. Frequently, off first phase or any complicated setups, England stood back and didn't blitz. They just waited on that advantage line until Ireland were done faffing around, then marched up, tackled them, bam, job done. However, once Ireland were disorganised or they were playing something simple, once the passage of the ball looked more linear, then they flew up and smashed. This is incredibly hard to achieve at most levels because it requires not just an immense amount of preparation, analysis and knowing your position, but rugby IQ from your forwards. However, Eddie Jones has managed to drill his team with an incredibly selective aggression. Ireland did scrape a couple of tries back, the more interesting of the two being this by Henshaw, as it just battered forward with actual pace, natural momentum and natural options until Murray was able to select a nice skip pass. The inside defence watching Lama, the outside defence where it could go wider, and then bam, Henshaw can sneak right through, grabbing the ball. But a more controlled performance by Ireland in the second half still wasn't enough to snap through England. Eddie Jones' side looked and felt in total control for maybe 75 out of the 80 minutes and across maybe 85 of the 100 metres. I don't think this should prompt too much panic for Ireland. Much as with their very similar deconstruction of Wales to a very similar scoreline, this was a case of two sides who are, on paper, reasonably evenly matched, executing to different levels on the day. After all, under Eddie, Twickenham has become, possibly behind only Eden Park, as the toughest away trip in Test Rugby, and England will be hoping Wales find much the same as they head to town next week. Ireland, meanwhile, won't actually be playing at anyone next week, so I... Uh, right, okay, um... This doesn't normally happen. Um, hope they have a nice week regardless. Because that might not be much fun for Ireland fans. But it's certainly something to add to the list in a Six Nations where even familiarity is a surprise. Because this championship is an adventure. <laughs> For anyone that didn't get that, that was a reference to the end of the Life Aquatic with Steve Zazu by Wes Anderson. I really want to commit hard to that theme, but I just I didn't have the time to go all in on that um, because I have been through all nine games of the men's tournament so far, plus one from the women's, plus uh, England France, which is kind of the, essentially the tournament designer in week one from the women's tournament. I am speaking of the women's tournament, going to be at the stoop for England against Wales this weekend. If anyone's there, say say hello, hi. Um, and then beyond that, as I say, I've gone through all the games so far. There's only two games in the men's tournament this weekend for me to wrap up during the, the, the week leading in to the final weekend um, because we're heading through. We're almost at the end of the Six Nations already. I don't know where it's all gone. Uh, but yeah, so there's there's the nine, pre there's ten match reports on the, including this one, uh, on the Six Nations for you to catch up on. Uh, if you fancy doing something else, like maybe, I don't know, lacrosse, 
um, you can head to the Find a Player app and you can go and have a look there. There's instructions in the descriptions there is on the other videos from the Six Nations. Um, it's a really lovely way to just find and meet people who are wanting to play whatever sport it is you're interested in. So there's there's the there's Squid Rugby group. If you fancy a game of sevens or touch and you want to speak to people that have watched these videos, you can head to there. Um, and even if you just want to meet some strangers and see, you know, someone nearby wants to do some badminton, go and play some badminton. It'll be great. Maybe there'll be some people doing that at the Stoop this weekend or in the other games which aren't affected by the coronavirus. I hope you're not affected by the coronavirus and I'll see you soon. That was a morbid way to go, wasn't it?